One of the most important things that leaders in the civil and infrastructure industry must do in today's world is they must be able to think years ahead of the game with the changing technology and everything going around in the industry, but they also must have to be drilled down to today to make fast decisions. In this week's episode of the Civil Engineering CEO, I'm talking with Kate Harris, President, CEO, and Chair of Stanley Consultants about how she does just this. Kate is awesome at this. She can think at the highest level, she can think years ahead, but she can also make a decision in the moment. And she's gonna talk to us today about how she does does that. She specifically has a routine that she uses. She has some questions that she asks herself, and she's going to share all of that with us today. But first, a word from our sponsor, Tensar. Before we go on here, I'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, Tensar International. Check out Tensar Plus, the award-winning design software for construction professionals to design with geosynthetics and calculate their value on projects. Tensar Plus is simple to use with a powerful engineering system at its core. Whether you're designing a crane pad or need to build a temporary road over muck, the cost, time, and carbon savings can be calculated, making comparison with alternatives simple. Whatever you're working on, Tensar Plus is your toolbox for success. All right, so now I'm excited to welcome our guest onto the show today. Kate Harris is president, CEO, and chair of Stanley Consultants. Um, we've had the pleasure of working with Stanley, and Kate has been a guest on one of our podcasts before. So, Kate, welcome to the Civil Engineering CEO. Thank you so much, Tony. I'm excited for the discussion we're going to be having. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. I mean, I, I get to talk with a lot of leaders in the industry, and you know, Kate is very plugged into kind of her team members and what they're doing. And, you know, she's really plugged into their kind of well-being. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But Kate, why don't you just start us off by telling us a little bit about the company? Tell us about Stanley, kind of where you're based out of, the type of services you offer, your size. Yeah. And, and thank you for saying that we're a people first organization. I know we're going to talk more about that. Uh, so founded in 1913, we, Stanley Consultants, are an industry leading engineering and consulting business that are driven by our purpose of improving lives. So we are mid-sized, we have about a thousand members, we're employee owned and we call those members. And we work with en energy and infrastructure clients around the world, really helping them solve some of the largest challenges in the natural environment. So we have, about, as I said, about a thousand members. We are located in over a couple of dozen uh, locations around the world. We've worked in all 50 states and over 120 countries. And we'll stop again by saying we're a people first organization and therefore our members are at the heart of everything we do. No, that's awesome. And, and maybe just for our listeners, like talk to us about your journey. How'd you get to Stanley? What attracted you to Stanley? That's really interesting because I really didn't have a very traditional career path at all. So like many others starting out, um, I had a really unusual range of skills and no vocation. And so I tried to figure out how best to explain you know, how I got to Stanley. And the best way I can do it is really talk about the kind of four or five things that I'm really interested in that kept me coming back to the industry and, and different places and finally arriving at Stanley. So the first is about people. OK, working with really smart, really committed people from all walks of life. I get energized by that. The second really talks to innovation and disruption and tech enablement and empowerment. I get excited about the opportunity of disruption, the challenge of disruption. So so things that you know, keep me thinking about how to do things differently. Well, they're going to keep me you know, very focused. So and then we kind of get into some other things. Excellence. I'm driven by excellence. I'm driven by empowerment in all again in all its forms, from business excellence through to client service excellence and behavioral excellence. I don't think we talk about that enough mm -hmm. and how that deals with, with values and ethics and integrity. And so those kind of bundles of things, I realize as I've gone through my career, and I've done lots of jobs inside and outside the industry. Um, that those are the things that keep me energized and those are the things that keep me coming back to, to, to different roles, different responsibilities. No, that's great. And I, and, I, and I do find it very interesting that Stanley refers to all of its employees as members. And I, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, yeah, and that's a really unusual term. And so I had to do some due diligence on this so I can get it right. And I do have a quote but I believe it's from the 1940s where Max Stanley, who was our CEO number two, 
um, really started talking about employees as members as part of the family rather than talking about just employees or assets. And we often hear our employees are our best asset. That's not how we think about our employees. We think about our members being our company. And so it tracks back to that. And then um, they started to formalize that. So today, you know, our employees are called members and we all share a passion for the direction of the company. That's great. I love that. It's like a real team mentality, you know, like everybody has a role in the team and the team can't you know, kind of operate well or win, if you will, unless every single person is doing their role, which I really like because that that emphasizes that people first mentality and the idea that we really need to kind of pour into everybody in our organization because everybody is kind of critical kind of to the mission. So, and I, and I just think it's little things like that, just how people are referred to that carry on throughout a company and that send a message, you know, you know, when you think about company culture, it's little things like that, that add up to be big things. Yeah. You know, it's a couple of things. When I first came to Stanley, I called them little acts of kindness. I would see things being done that we wouldn't see necessarily in a different environment or a larger company culture, just a real care and attention. I think that's, that's part of the key. And then I think for leaders, we just have to have our feet in our mouth moving the same direction constantly. So, you know, tone matters, behavior matters, action matters, communication matters. These things matter to our members because they're part of who we are. We talk about shared reward and shared responsibility because we're proud to enable and support them and reward and recognize them throughout their careers with us. Yeah, no, I think that that's very important in the world we live in today and still not not obvious or, or def- necessarily common in the industry. So it's something that I think is, is very, very powerful. <clears throat> and so the industry is growing. I mean, I think anyone who's anywhere near this industry knows that we're in a boom right now. It's more and more infrastructure needs are coming, you know, firms are growing. As a leader in the industry, someone who's, you know, one of the leaders in the firm, of course, guiding the firm. How do you think about, you know, growth when things are moving so fast? You know, we want to grow, we want to capitalize on it, but, you know, you also have to think about, you know, the short term of your members and everything that's going on. So just take me a little bit into your thought process and into this firm growing over the next few years when it's going to happen, but there's ways it has to happen to be sustainable. And it's a great question because the world is changing really fast. And so, uh, you know, when we think about strategy and Stanley, we're not just thinking about those old strategic mega trends, macro trends. We're thinking about clients. We're thinking about communities. We're thinking about our own families and our members. And we're trying to figure out where the world's going because you're right, it's changing so fast that I think an engineering companies have a real opportunity and a real um, mandate to make sure that we are changing with the world and we're not continuing to do what we've always done. And so for me, at the heart of of, um, strategy for Stanley is, we already know we have a great reputation, we have a great business platform, our end markets are fantastic, we're in energy and infrastructure, so they're counter cyclical, they are poised for growth. So we, we know we have the platform. The real question is what do you do with that in the next three, five, 10 years? And so at Stanley, we're committed to changing and adapting and leveraging what we know for the next three, five days in different ways. So Mm -hmm. for our industry, I really believe we have to take a really good hard look at, you know, how we do things, not just who, what we do for our clients and communities. So we have, you you would not be surprised to know we have a very strong technology and innovation and tech enablement piece to this. And so we are really looking inside ourselves and figuring out how do we innovate at scale? So how do we grow, keep our, size from a kind of an intimacy of client relationships and agility perspective, those, those kind of pieces that are all about Stanley and how do we keep those but build something different? And so we're doing some really wonderful things at the moment, exciting things, right? So we are partnering with um, you know, technology platforms to better um, ideate and, and to speak to our own people. So we have ideation platforms really around democratizing people's voices. We know that we're in a hybrid environment or a remote environment now. We are concerned about you know, the ability not just to reach out to our members, but have them have a say. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about that. You may have seen in the, in, in the news recently that we are, have just launched a large global challenge all around um, trying to protect public health 
through the removal and destruction of PFAS. And mm. we're prepared to partner with people not like us to bring the best ideas uh, to our clients and to our communities. So lots of rich technology enablement, lots of bringing different capabilities into the organization to supplement our our engineering and design capabilities with management advisory services, with technology enabled solutions, you know, just trying to bring that blend of excellence to, to our clients. So that's one part of our strategy. Another part of our strategy really talks to thinking about, you know, our company of the future. You know, what experience are we creating for our for our members? And so we're doing a lot of work around just challenging ourselves with the help of our members to think a little differently about flexibility and autonomy. You know, the balance between professional ambition and personal circumstance, they are new things for energy, for, for uh, sort of uh, companies around the world in, in our industry. And we're really talking hard and listening hard with them because we want to create an environment of excellence for them as well. And so, and then the last thing is when we think about our end markets, we're convinced that clients, there aren't really any pure play solutions anymore. There are no pure play challenges. Mm. So we are very fortunate to be in energy and infrastructure, water transportation. We work well and, and, and uh, across those. And so we've chosen eight areas which we think are important for our clients and where we can draw from the breadth of Stanley capabilities um, to be able to provide more joined up solutions. So whether that's, you know, electric vehicles or whether that's climate science or whether that is asset management, right through to delivering differently because there just aren't enough engineers coming into our industry. Uh, we're committed to using the company's you know, investments uh, along with our capabilities to really think hard about what's needed today and tomorrow to help our clients kind of navigate well, I think it's very dynamic, very exciting, but also very challenging times for them. So um, for us, growth is all around building what we do, leveraging our proud and trusted uh, networks and relationships, and then really thoughtfully challenging, strategically challenging what we do and how we're going to do it to help lead our clients through and navigate uh, through what is, is quite a dynamic and fast-paced environment. Yeah, I mean, those are all awesome. And I think going back to that first one for a minute, the whole idea of, you know, adapting and innovating, you know, with the industry. I think that if you're a firm that's in the civil infrastructure space and you're not thinking like 10 years ahead, like you're behind basically at this point, because there's new software every day, there's new things that are changing. And, you know, I think that one of the examples of this is when COVID hit, you know, for years and years, everybody said, you know, civil engineering companies can't, people can't be remote. Everyone has to be in the office. And like, basically like overnight, everybody was remote, right? And it kind of right, like right. that whole thing was blown out of the water. And I think that's just an example of, you know, this industry is the technology is going to be a huge driver and the firms that are willing to adapt to that, learn about that, you know, be on the cutting edge of that are going to be leaders in the industry. And I think the other thing, Kate, is all of our clients that we talk to, the biggest challenge is hiring, right? Hiring enough people to do the work that's coming. And, the reality is, is that there's probably more work coming. So if you can't hire enough people now to do the work, it, that problem is going to get kind of harder to solve. And I do think technology can present solutions to that. You know, I mean, listen, I don't think that, you know, the 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 job of an engineer or technical professional is going to necessarily be 100% automated, but I do think that there's going to be programs and software that can help us to work more efficiently and can help us to do this work. And, you know, one of the last things that you said there about leading your clients, I think is the other end of it. I think that software is great. We need it, but we also need to be able to communicate and lead people, right? I mean, that's, that's my thing. That's why I started EMI. And, you know, I know it's something that Kate's passionate about. I know Stanley's passionate about it. We're actually doing some work with Stanley right now. We're helping them to build a new leadership development program, which I'm excited to work with them on. And, you know, I think, I think Kate, Anytime a company shows that they want to invest in their leaders like that, it tells me that you're really thinking about, you know, equipping them to be able to handle these challenges and lead people during these times. And, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that, but it seems like Stanley is really focused on, you know, giving their leaders what they need to succeed. Oh, look, you know, we've just come out of a global pandemic. Our people are the same as everybody around the world. You know, we're um, a little polarized. 
we're a little remote, we're a little burnt out, and um, and our people are precious to us. They're, they're incredibly capable and competent, but we're coming out of this together. And so we spent a lot of time listening to them. We, we did an engagement survey all through the pandemic, um, did, you know, really keep, kept people connected. We brought lots of programs in just to support them and their family. And as we're all coming out together, the question we're asking is, are we doing enough? Are we doing enough for our people? And the answer came back, maybe. Right. Um, we had a lot of variability in, in some of the responses because of that kind of dissonance in the world right now. I, I think we've lost a little bit of the art of the ability to engage when we don't agree. And so, you know, having conversations was important. We went on a listening tour. People said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen better. And we're going to figure out what you need from us. And so, you know, we are very, very focused on growth, and but we're also very focused on people leadership. And so we started looking hard at, you know, do other people, are, are our people content with what we're providing for them? Are our leaders, you know, happy to be leaders in some cases? You know, some people want to be managers, not leaders. And mm. it's a very different skill set. And then we started saying, well, what more can we do for you? And that's that's when we kind of reached out, uh, Tony, and we started talking to you again. You know, you and I have talked on and off for four or five years now, and I just was waiting for the time saying, listen, let's do something special and different. This isn't an internal program where our own people try to teach others how to lead. I think it's important that we model every day, and, and the tone at the top around leadership is critically important. Um, as is the sponsorship on these types of programs. But really, we wanted to bring outside people in to help broaden our, our thinking, give us better peripheral vision, and just do it in a way where we were explaining to our people, listen, our investment in you is, is broader than you just coming to work every day. Mm. Okay, We are member-owned, employee-owned, and so you know, you know, our people are incredibly important to us. We know that as there's going to be less and less engineers to, to bring on, that, that we're going to use technology to enable and help us with effectiveness and value creation. But ultimately, the experience that we create is our brand and the experience that our people create both inside and outside the organization is, is paramount. So we're doing some thinking. We're looking at some different modules. Some are very traditional, you know, what are the tools and techniques needed? You know, how can we help you to, to learn your craft of, uh, and develop your craft of, of skills in, in, in leadership? And some of them are really philosophical. You know, what does it mean to be a leader in Stanley? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do we think about our values and our purpose and how do we ingrain that in our culture? And so this is an exciting program for us. We're, we're in early days developing that with you. But um, I, th I think that all organizations um, who are in the people business um, have an obligation, not just to develop their, their kind of delivery and technical capabilities, but really help their people understand, you know, the role and the privilege of leadership, you know, on a daily basis. So it, it, it's just an exciting time. Yeah. And I think something that you said there that's really important is, you know, what does it mean to be a leader at Stanley? And I think that that's every company needs to think about that for their leaders is you have to have a kind of a, you know, everyone is their own person and they're going to have their own tendencies and leadership styles, but there certainly can be an overarching kind of leadership philosophy that a company can kind of hold in high regard that can be very helpful for a leader and kind of guiding them in the right direction. And what I really like about the program that we're, we're getting the chance to work on with Stanley is they are really, we're taking the values, you know, at Stanley's direction, we're taking their values and we're asking the leaders questions about those values and how they tie to certain skill sets. And we're going to be building the program around that, which to me is very powerful because a lot of times what happens in the industry is nine out of 10 professionals don't know what the values of the company are. They're on the website, but they never read them. They never go to the website. And so by kind of weaving them into your leadership philosophy and providing some, you know, training and support around it, it just becomes what they're living on a daily basis. And it becomes very, you know, it just kind of, it's built into it, if you will. And I think that that's what's powerful. And I know at EMI, we have very simple values, give, guide, grow. That's what we tell people every day. We give our all, we guide each other, we grow together. If you want to work at EMI, you've got to be able to give, guide, and grow. And by you know constantly talking about these things, weaving them into your meetings and stuff, people start to get that mindset and they start to share it with other people. And so, I think it's great what you're doing, Kate, and you know investing in your leaders in this way and doing it in a way that's so specific that you know 
It's like getting people on the same page, building that consistency. And I really think that that's something in our industry that's becoming more difficult because of all the reasons you mentioned, like, you know, there's remote going on, there's fast growth going on, which means people are acquiring other firms and bring them into their firm. And then you kind of have two cultures that you're kind of, you know, putting together. Right. And so anything you can do around programming or things where you can try to, you know, build that consistency and get people, you know, when I say thinking the same way, like I said, everyone's different and they have their strengths and you want that individuality, but you also got to have like an overarching mindset. Like we're here to help you to build these things. And so it's definitely exciting. And I would imagine Kate, for you being able to interact with all these different leaders across your organization from your seat must just be an exciting thing to do on a regular basis. Oh, you know, so um, what's kind of interesting about that is, you know, turn at the top counts a huge amount. And, and so, you know, that brand ambassador starts at, at the top and works its way through. Um, you know, for me, you know, leading Stanley is just a privilege. So I like a, a servant leadership style approach rather than the hierarchical one. And oftentimes, you know, I, I have to be careful that I don't engage too much and cause too much disruption. So <laughs> this is perfect for me because I get to be in, in the classroom listening and, and, and interacting and just um, really sort of engaging with our people. So that's that's just passion and a privilege. So I am looking for any excuse, including this one, <laughs> to continue with engaging with people because I think, again, we're in the people business, right? And if our Brand is the experience that we're creating on a daily basis inside and outside our organization. Then our leaders are our brand ambassadors. And so there's nothing worse than being philosophically aligned or values-based misalignment, okay? It's just uncomfortable for everyone. So while we're all different, we all do come together under our purpose and our values because that defines who we are, how we treat people, how we think. And it's kind of our deepest health held beliefs and so you know if you're if you're if you're a fantastic um sort of uh, member but you're not aligned it doesn't make you a bad person it just means that this environment probably is not the right one for you and so um Mm. having those conversations because i think honesty and transparency and engagement will come together in how we think about leadership no that's awesome all right i'm going to switch gears a little bit we have a lot of listeners that are in the civil infrastructure industry and they really want to become leaders at the highest level in their organizations and they're passionate about leadership. And so one one of the questions that I want to ask you is when you're a leader in an organization, you know, it's a good sized organization for sure. You have a lot of people to kind of guide and you have leaders that you work with for sure. But just tell me about your mindset on a daily basis. Like I can only imagine that you have a hundred things on your mind at any given second. So when you come to work every day, you know, how do you try to understand like where your focus needs to be when there's just so many things going on? I'm always, I'm always very interested in that when I talk to someone in your seat. That's kind of interesting because I do a lot of work before I come to work, right? So I do a lot of thinking. I don't read emails before I come to work generally, but I do a lot of research and I'm just looking at those kind of social media posts that, you know, are outside our industry, frankly. I'm not really interested in um, imitation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, in you know, support. So I'll, I'll thumbs up or like, you know, a lot of competitive posts, which I think is quite unusual. Um, but really, uh, you know, this is an advocacy for the industry. What I try to do is think about, you know, all the things going on around the world where we inside our industry may not be having a, a you know, strong peripheral vision. So I do a lot of that, you know, early in the morning just to try and get my, my brain thinking, um, peripherally and and in an agile way because I think that's pretty much the key is agility so and with agility comes discipline and we're not good at that generally so so I want to help everybody you know and and I have to become more disciplined so I block time out specifically at key points so I'm the chair of our board and every day the day after our quarterly meetings I I just don't come into the office and I sit and I reflect Mm -hmm. and so I think reflection time is a privilege um, so it's not just response time, it's reflection time as well. And then, you know, the, the challenge with CEOs is we have really difficult jobs on a wide range of topics. So, so we never get the easy decision to make, um, quite rightly. And so everything is kind of marginal. And you're hoping that on balance you're making the you know, better decisions than not, but you're having to course correct as facts become known and the situation changes. So I think agility is really important, the ability to deal with that kind of, 
Now, hey, no real right answer here. It's not a binary issue. We're trying to think through the right thing and we're trying to engage on that. So we're triangulating, we're listening, we're coping. And then at the end of the day, you have to have an amount of speed and discipline because decisions have to get made. And so I think it's more a range of coping skills and decision-making skills rather than, you know, having an average day because no day will be average. So, you know, I, I think for me, discipline combined with agility, combined with feeling, feeling comfortable with uncertainty, triangulating, engaging, course correcting, and directionally moving forward, I think, are the key issues rather than, hey, did I do a good day's work here and, and, and did, I, um, did I make the right decision? Very different in a CEO role than it would be coming up through an organization. Yeah, no, and I, I think, Kate, that's, that's what I've always kind of admired about you is you seem to be, like I was saying before, you seem to be able to think at a high level where you could think like years ahead of the industry. But at the same time, to your point, I think you have to be able to bring it down to the ground and make a decision because I think that's always a challenge for leaders, right? Like they tend to be able to do one or one of those good and not the other, either one type of thing, you know? Um Especially when I see a lot of these engineering professionals or very technical professionals that have gone into the leadership ranks, they tend to be more like, I want to make the decision like now, you know? Um, so it sounds like that reflection for you is kind of that trigger that can kind of bridge between those two things. You know, I spend a lot of time asking myself, what problem am I trying to solve here? And then I ask people, and often I find that we don't agree on what the problem is. And so I think that leads us to places of uncertainty and that leads us to places where we just can't get our arms around it. So I've, I've, I've kind of sort of told our organization, particularly my team, you're going to come, if you're going to come with a problem, you're going to be able to articulate what the problem is. You're going to be able to articulate what the options are. You're going to come with a recommendation. We're going to figure this out together. We're not going to, we're not going to leave you hanging out there. Um, but the same token, you know, we, we do have to have leaders who can articulate, uh, critically think, and if they're not solving a problem, then they're recommending what we should do. And so that, I think, is a mental discipline and mental development issue for us. Um, but we are so much better when we're, we're in a team. And so these big issues, they don't get decided in a vacuum. There's lots of people that are involved in giving a view before we decide what we're going to do. Yeah, I really like that. I like that philosophy of like asking yourself as a leader, like, you know, what problems am I trying to solve for the organization? Um, you know, listen, I think we're always trying to solve problems for our clients, but I think as leaders, we also need to think about internally, like wh how, what are some things that we can do to get our, our people going in the right direction or help them to be a little bit better um, or just give them the time that they need to do other things. And, and, and for those of you out there listening, I think if you want to take some action on what Kate's saying, I think creating some pockets of time for your own reflection or do some deep thinking can be very important. I've been trying to look at my calendar a little bit and maybe one day a week, try to get a block of time for that because, you know, we get a lot of projects and you get working in those projects and it's great and you deliver that work, but you're going to miss like some of the longer term mm -hmm. things that are coming that you can capitalize on or through, you know, someone that, that you can really, you know, promote or work with because you're not like paying attention when you step back and look at that big picture. And so I would kind of challenge everybody out there to see if you can weave some of that time into your calendars. Um, you know, I always love when our guests can give us some key things to do. And I think that that's something you could take from this. And I think, Kate, one of the other questions I'd love to ask you, and I get this question all the time from professionals in the industry is, how can I make sure that I'm driving value for my organization? Like, how would you answer that question if someone was trying to figure that out? So I think you've got to define value first, right? Because value means different things for different people. If you think about our company, it's our value to our shareholders. It's our value to members in terms of the environment that we create. Um, but if you go to value creation for clients, it's around, you know, joined up thinking, strategic mm -hmm. services, you know, the ability to bundle and cross sell what you know, so they're getting the best of your company. So that, I mean, from a value creation perspective, I'll say that, you know, um, we think very hard across all those lenses. And then we look at our, our communities and we say, listen, how do we create value there? We're very philanthropic. We have a foundation. Um, you know, one of the proudest moments for me was during the pandemic where we saw a lot of our industries kind of take that 2008 playbook and say, OK, we've got to, you know, um, separate a lot of staff. We've got to deal with, you know, um, pay raises and, and, and base pay. 
And we were really thoughtful and said, this is not this issue. It is not of this time. You know, 2008 was a financial crisis with people impacts. The pandemic is a people crisis with, with financial impacts. And so really just over that sort of two, three years, you know, came out and gave, you know, over a quarter of a million dollars to the homeless, to frontline workers, to the food banks, just living our values. And, and really for me, you know, when we came out of it, it became really difficult with, you know, political views around masks and mandates and vaccines and et cetera, et cetera. We just went back to values and said, how should we think about this if our purpose is improving lives and if our values include looking after our own, right? And so, you know, from my perspective, value creation to a community is how thoughtful we are in terms of how we leverage our foundation and our, our members' time and resources. Inside the company, we have all sorts of great programs around creating real experiential value to our people. And in, as it relates to clients, I think you've got to look at, you know, what is your value creation strategy? How are you going to use the company's platform and smarts and skills to really drive value, which could be a new service, it could be helping thinking about how to accelerate, you know, electric vehicles and, and what happens to client funding when you do those things. You know, how should we think about climate science? How should we think about asset planning if we're using old data that doesn't represent where the world is going? Is the value the use of the data or, or is the value helping clients think about long range planning and making sure they're making good decisions for themselves, you know, their balance sheet? And their communities too. So I, I think that the challenge I think is well define value creation. Okay, um, we think it's multi lens, we think it's multi focus, um, but at the end of the day, you know, the the outcome of value creation is our clients, our communities, our members feel valued and valuable, whether that's service offering or that's environmental. And so, um, you know, it's a little bit of a difficult question for me to answer, but we're passionate about making a difference. And I think, you know, that's probably a positive difference. We should probably say that. Um, and so we probably would, th would link that maybe to value creation and say in all these areas, are you making a positive difference? Are you helping improving lives today and tomorrow? And our investment in our people, our investment uh, and, uh, you know, in acquisitions and partnerships is all around purposefully becoming better um, as who we are and helping leaving, leaving a sustainable and rich world for everybody. No, I think that's great. And I really think like one of the big takeaways of our conversation here today is as leaders, it's really helpful for you to have some questions to reflect on and think through for yourself, right? Like, why am I here? What am I helping my company? You know, what problems are we solving, right? What, what does value mean and who am I giving value to, right? I think Kate has kind of created a, a just a, a list almost of really good questions. And listen, some of them might work for you, but you're going to have to come up with your own for sure too, depending on your situation. And I would also imagine that this list of questions, if you will, is probably going to change for you as a leader pretty regularly. But I think the idea of having some guiding questions that you can use in these reflection periods that we've talked about can really help you to make sure you remain plugged in to big picture and also to your people, right? You got to have that big picture and then also be down on the ground like we talked about. And, you know, that can really, I think we need that guidance. And, you know, of course you want to get whatever help and guidance you can get from others, mentors and, and, and the like, but you're going to need also to have, be able to give yourself some guidance. I think that's every leader needs to have that conversation with yourself, that reflection time. Um, and that's really critical. So Kate, just to kind of wrap us up, maybe what's one last thing that you can leave our listeners with, you know, they're excited about growing their careers over the coming years. They want to invest in themselves in any way that they can, you know, how, what would you kind of, your last words that you would leave them with to where they might want to think about as they grow? Oh, it, you know, everybody's career journey is their own, right? And so mine was a little unusual because as I said, I had an unusual range of skills. Um, I had some passions and I really didn't understand those till later on, um, but I was always curious. And I think you know, I remember somebody say, hey, what's the one attribute that you would encourage from others? And, and I'd say curiosity every time, mm. putting ethics aside for a minute, um, curiosity. So, so I think it doesn't have to be linear. So I was talking to a high school um, 
a group of uh, young women, about 300 women, and some of them wanted to talk about STEM. And they were asking me these questions about, you know, how did your career happen? You know, how do you deal with being different? All of those things. And, and just having a conversation around, it's okay to be different. Mm. It doesn't feel like it when you're young, but it becomes a really positive attribute when you're older because we want the best decisions we want the best conversations and so we don't want to have those with ourselves so daring to be different being comfortable in your skin I think is really important the second is you know your career journey is is yours right mm. and so don't imitate don't emulate it doesn't matter what everybody else is doing I did lots of rotation work where everybody was kind of going through this linear career progression and what I found is that when I came to this job in Stanley all of a sudden I knew what questions to ask. And I had real privilege in my background. It seemed slow when I was doing rotations, two, three year rotations, and sometimes I hated them. I wasn't very good at them, but it really helped you know, sort of uh, create some self-awareness for me and also helped me kind of form, you know, what have I learned, Where's I'm going? where am I going with this? How, how do I apply what I've learned? And also how do I, you know, get rid of the things I don't like and I'm not good at and I don't you know and, and I don't align with from a behavior it you know these career trajectories that have really really accelerated often we're not asking ourselves what did we learn that we don't want to do mm. as part of our leadership journey and so you know I think there's the comfort in your own skin I think Im no imitation uh, you know you'll find great mentors and advisors who will not only support you but challenge you in your thinking I think it's very, very positive to do that. And then, you know, just trust your instinct, right? Mm. Um, we often get that conditioned out of us in traditional schools and in traditional workplaces. Your instinct is everything, right? If it, if it feels wrong, it is wrong. Uh, if it feels right, it is right. And, you know, just get that triangulated and checked. Go to people that don't agree with you. Go to people who think differently. Go to people who can endorse you. And so look inside and outside your network and just build that out and ask those questions because the more you can know about yourself, the more purposeful I think you're, you're uh, and enjoyable, frankly, your career progression is going to be. So, um, And again, I didn't know any of that <laughs> starting my career. I kind of reflect on what I learned and I said, Boy, I'm glad I had some great people who said, you know what, I don't agree with you. I don't think that's right. And it allowed me to really form and trust and develop my gut. And so, you know, curiosity and instinct, I think, become, you know, really strong leadership toolkit pieces. And then the other thing, we, we talk a lot about authenticity, Tony, when we talk about leaders and you know, what's your authentic style. I am a fan of vulnerability. And so, you know, the ability to say, I don't know, or I don't understand, or help me understand, um, you know, is, is a really powerful connector with people because leaders look to us to be confident and forward looking and pace setting and directional, but they also look for us to be human. And so the humanity in leadership is something I hope that we're going to talk more about as, as we develop that toolkit for, for the leaders in our organization and those of leaders of the future. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm excited that after I finish this interview with Kate, I'm going to start making a list of questions for myself for self-reflection. I think every leader should do it. And I think, you know, Kate gave us a lot of good leads that we can start on at least, and then kind of make it your own. Um, once again, Kate Harris, president, CEO, and chair of Stanley Consultants. Kate, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here on the Civil Engineering CEO. Outstanding. It's, it's always a pleasure to talk to Tony. Thank, thanks for having me on. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Kate. I mean, she is awesome because she is high level, but she also is right down to the ground talking with everyone that she works with, helping them make decisions, but she also knows when to kind of step back. And that's really, really the art of leadership, especially for someone in this technical industry to be able to do that. If you like the video, please consider subscribing to our channel here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.